Welcome to Science 7. This is Lesson 8 in our Ecology Unit. So today we're talking about how energy flows through ecosystems. And we touched on a little bit of this when we were looking at our owl pellets. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here. So what we need to think about is how energy is lost at each level of the food chain. And it's lost because energy is given up as heat. And a great deal of energy is used for moving, healing, and growing. Most energy is lost to the non-living environment. So it's it's put out there into the air and the water and the soil. It does not disappear, but it's in a form that the animals can't use anymore. So as energy flows through the ecosystem from producers to consumers to detrivores and decomposers, at every level energy is lost. And remember that we talked about how all energy initially comes from the sun. Plants use that energy to produce their own food and only about 10% of that energy is stored in its roots and leaves. So that that's the only energy available to a primary consumer that eats it. So 90% of the energy that the producers get from the sun ends up lost just through basic survival things that they need to do. So the same is true for the herbivore. Only 10% of its energy is available for the secondary consumer to use. And that would be true for the secondary consumer. Only 10% of its energy would be available for whatever predator would be hunting and eating it. So if you think about 100% of the energy starting with the sun, as it goes up and you're losing 90% each time through each species, you're essentially looking at, by the time you get to the top of some food chains and food webs, that that particular predator is only getting maybe 1% of the totally available energy from the plants to begin with. Okay? So the energy pyramid shape shows how the amount of useful energy that enters each level decreases as it's used by the organisms in that level. So as a result, by the time the energy is passed through that food chain, very little is left for that apex predator, predator, which is why there are always way fewer of them than the lower levels. There just aren't the resources or the energy to support a higher population. Now the ecological pyramid is another model. So we've talked about models in terms of our nested circle diagrams. The ecological pyramid is another model that's used to show energy loss in a food chain. So each level in that pyramid is called a trophic level, and you can count the levels by counting the number of steps from producers to the last consumer. And I'll show you an example of that on the next slide. The base holds the producers and goes up from there. So in any ecosystem, you find a huge number of insects to eat the plants, but a much smaller number of organisms in subsequent levels due to less available energy. So here's an ecological pyramid here. And the shape of this pyramid shows how the amount of useful energy that enters each level decreases as it's used by the organisms in that level. This means that the consumers at the top of the food pyramid, and in this example we have our owl, have much less energy available to them to support them than the closer, ones closer to the bottom. So as you can see down here, you have lots and lots of producers. You have quite a few primary consumers. You're getting less secondary consumers. And by the time you hit the top, you have the, the fewest. Consumers. Eventually, the amount of useful energy left can't support another level. That's why the energy flow is modeled in the shape of the pyramid. So you start down at the bottom with a very wide base and lots of energy up to a point where there's not very much energy at all. At all. So as an example, male orcas range in size from 3,700 to 5,500 kilos and females from 1,400 to 3,700 kilos. So some orca populations are residents. That means the resident populations of orcas tend to eat fish, such as salmon, as the main part of their diet. The transient populations of orcas eat other marine mammals, such as seals, sea lions, dolphins, and porpoises. Now, orcas in general, regardless of whether they're resident or transient, need to eat about 5% of their body mass a day. So that's a lot. Okay, 5% of 5,500 is 275 pounds every day of food, and that's minimum. That's just enough to keep going. So sea otters, who don't have that layer of blubber to help keep them warm, a lot of their energy is expended just in heat and maintaining their body temperature. They have to eat over 25% of their body weight every day just to maintain their body function. That's like you, if you weigh 100 pounds, having to eat 100 quarter pounders a day just to keep functioning. It's, a, it's an amazing amount of food that's needed by some of these animals. So scientists use this pyramid of biomass to illustrate food energy loss. They calculate the mass at each level of the pyramid, with the lower levels having significantly greater mass than the levels above. Carnivores may not eat the whole animal. When they don't do that, that leaves those waste materials for the detrivores and the decomposers. So with those decomposers and recycling the matter, so I mentioned that whatever's left over from the animals, the detrivores and the decomposers take over. And we've talked a little bit about the importance of decomposers. 
and how if we didn't have decomposers that we would just be neck deep in garbage. So as decomposers break down those foods, they use the last of that available energy in the food chain and they release those nutrients back into the soil, air, and water. Those nutrients are vital for other organisms to survive. If those decomposers didn't release those nutrients back in, plants, for example, would have nothing to draw on to grow themselves. So decomposers keep the matter moving between the living and the non-living parts of the ecosystem. They, they're part of that really important cycle. So decomposers are microscopic, which means they're teeny, teeny, tiny. You can't see them without a microscope, but should not be underestimated due to their size. So what we would say is that their importance is vastly unproportional to their size. Okay, so they are tiny, but they play a huge, huge role in the ecosystem. So composting. When you compost, you're relying on the decomposers to take care of the waste and release those nutrients it contains. The composter can be considered its own ecosystem in that the ecosystems like small decomposers like worms, mites, grubs, and insects, they all chew and digest and mix up that waste. As they do this, air is introduced to the mix which allows the decomposers to start their job. Without air, decomposers won't work. So compost is very rich in nutrients for that reason and is very, very good for your garden. Dying salmon do the same thing to riverbeds and forests that they die in. This is important for their hatching eggs in the spring. If those salmon don't die on the riverbed, they'll die in the river, the decomposers can't release those nutrients back into the water, and those eggs have no nutrients to draw on as they're developing to hatch into new salmon. So salmon acquire nutrients in the ocean as well, so when they decompose, the nutrients from the ocean are released into the river and forest, thus linking those e ecosystems that may be thousands of kilometers apart. So everything is linked and everything is important. Okay, so we will talk more about this in class. We'll see you next time.